Okay, thank you. So I'll just request if in the meantime, if you can take over the control of letting everybody in, right? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, so I'm passing, you have the lobby controls with you. Um, uh, everybody, uh, thank you for joining. Uh, I appreciate the time that you're giving me today. Uh, my name is Abhijit Anand. I, um, you know, and uh, I, I'm hoping I can make, uh, you know, make, uh, uh, you know, show some value to you in what we're about to present. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to say this uh, inter for compliance that the session is being recorded. The intention is that we'll publish it on, uh, on YouTube. I'd like to make this session interactive. My colleagues on the chat, uh, you know, are watching for your questions. So if you have any queries uh, throughout the session, we'll try and answer them as we go along. But in case we are not able to answer them, I would appreciate if you can drop your uh, your email address or your telephone number, and then we'll try and you know get back to you on on the responses. Um, all right, um, Shweta. In between, if you find that my voice starts giving problems, or if uh, you find the screen stuck, if you can just call me, and I'll I'll make the corrections, please. I'd I'd really appreciate that. Yeah, and I want to thank you for 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 setting this up. Um, all right, everybody. I'll we'll get started. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, Zindagi Technologies, this is not a sales pitch. I just want to present who we are and what we do. I'll then talk very, very briefly about uh, uh, about Wi-Fi 6, a very high level primer as to why, what Wi-Fi 6 is and how it is differentiated from the previous generations of Wi-Fi. We'll then talk about Wi-Fi from an Indian perspective. Right from an India perspective, we'll try and understand that why Wi-Fi matters, right? And uh, we will then switch roles and talk about the role of Wi-Fi in education, uh, in schools, colleges, and universities, and remote education as well. Uh, what role does Wi-Fi play in education and overall? Uh, then we'll talk about this campus implementation that we uh, that we did for an organization uh, uh, in India. It was a 47-acre, you know, smart campus. Um, and, uh, you know, we basically threw the entire kitchen sink of technology for them. We've implemented cyber security, network access control, uh, video conferencing, video surveillance, and then Wi-Fi was a major chunk, right, because they wanted to develop a smart campus for themselves. So we'd like to share the lessons that we learned and what best, best practices we incorporated when we were implementing uh, Wi-Fi for this customer. We'll then focus on how should you, in our opinion, without pontificating, we'd like to talk about how should you approach a Wi-Fi 6 implementation as a Wi-Fi, as a consultant for a customer? And then we'll talk about general best practices, which are applicable not just to Wi-Fi 6, but in general to Wi-Fi deployments. That's the way we've sorted it out. And as I said, we'll try and make it interactive. If you have any questions, just type, type them in the chat box. Our CTO, uh, Sana Khan, is there to, to answer questions uh, for you on the chat itself. Um, so, uh, all right, so uh, everybody, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Abhijit uh, Singh Anand. I'm the chief evangelist and uh, and uh, CEO uh, and founder of Zindagi Technologies. I started the company uh, around five years ago. I still consider myself to be somewhat of a developer, an architect, and a consultant. I've had the honor to uh, to work in one of the a few of the largest opportunities. Uh, you know, um, uh, for this nation to develop national and state data centers, uh, developing large scale uh, campus LAN and WAN solutions, setting up uh, setting up command and control centers for uh, defense forces in smart cities, as well as work on multiple public and, and private cloud designs. Um, about Zindagi, um, we, you know, the, the three questions that we ask ourselves is our why, uh, our how and our, our, and our what, uh, why do we exist? Uh, how do we do what we do and and uh, what is it that we actually do? Um, our why we believe that uh, you know uh, you know our job as as IT consultants and professional services is to help uh, understand the customers' needs and wants and empathize with them and then use technology solutions uh, to create uh, you know to create value for our customers. Uh, how do we do it? We basically get in, get involved in the entire life cycle of the project. We build, integrate, optimize, and manage superior innovative technology solutions. We've got hundreds of certified engineers on board with years of experience uh, doing this. 
Uh, in terms of governance and process, we have a PMO, a project management office that ensures that we follow governance throughout the entire life cycle. And we are ISO 9001 um, and ISO 27001 certified. What do we offer? We specialize in consulting, uh, you know, small to medium sized businesses and, and, and enterprises. Uh, what do we do? We provide managed services and professional services. We'd like to consider ourselves to, as somebody who, who offers the full plate of managed services. But if I were to choose three, I would, I would say that we have a good hold in cybersecurity, cloud and data analytics, and large scale uh, campus design. Um, so uh, this is the last slide I promise where we're going to talk about ourselves. We'll then try and make the session as educational as possible. Um, a question that I'm often asked is that why do we call ourselves uh, Zindagi? Um, because Zindagi in, in Hindi and Urdu means uh, means lives. Um, when we started the company, we were thinking of what to call ourselves. And then uh, we actually got inspiration from, from Richard Branson's quote that a business is nothing else but an idea that will make other people's lives better. And I think technologies are, you know, I think the greatest enabler uh, for, for helping improve people's lives. With that said, let's talk about one technology which is very close to my heart, which is Wi-Fi. Uh, and why Wi-Fi plays such a critical role in, uh, in improving lives. Um, now, uh, let's talk about Wi-Fi from an Indian perspective first, right? Um, over the past two years, Primarily because of the pandemic, we've seen that Wi-Fi usage has gone up by 50%. Um, the economic value of Wi-Fi in the year 2021 is 132 billion uh, US dollars in 2021, and it's it's supposed to double by the year 2025. Now the question arises: How do we? How are we monetizing it? Uh, I was I had struggles converting 132 billion US dollars into into Indian rupees, that's a lot of money. So how do we, how is, how is it that we are monetizing, uh, you know, this much of currency only because of Wi-Fi? So a lot of us are using iPhones and Android phones and we keep switching to Wi-Fi calling so that we get better coverage. 40% of the entire traffic of the country on 2G, 3G, 4G is getting offloaded to Wi-Fi. And had that not been here, we would not have been even getting signal bars and we would have been facing problems calling each other. Bharatnet, the uh, the Indian um, uh, you know national fiber optic network is a is a wire mesh that we spread all across the country. But to truly leverage Bharatnet at you know the rural and isolated geographies to bridge the di the digital divide and to help uh, rural and low income communities to benefit from from the high capacity and the affordable connectivity that Wi-Fi offers, we have to make sure that Wi-Fi permeates all of these locations. Uh, so there's an initiative called PM Vani, the Prime Minister's uh, Wi-Fi Access Network Interface, which basically says that we have to provide one crore um, Wi-Fi hotspots across the entire country by the year 2022. And we are currently at 400,000. We have a long way to go, right? And more or less every aspect of our lives, we see that Wi-Fi is touching us, right? Be it workplaces where we see telepresence and productivity enhancements because of Wi-Fi, be it airports and airlines where vital operations are uh, are running on Wi-Fi. By the way, one of our prestigious customers was uh, was an airport in the eastern part of the country where we implemented Wi-Fi for them. And all their critical operations uh, of all the airlines were actually on Wi-Fi, so it was mission critical for them. Schools are, you know, dependent upon Wi-Fi for downloading online courseware and educational tools. Factories are tracking efficiencies and and revolutionize and revolutionizing manufacturing uh, because of uh, Wi-Fi. And any sort of next generation applications that we talk about, be it 4K video streaming, be it 8K video streaming, be it augmented reality, be it virtual reality, be it IoT, everything has got a bedrock of of good solid uh, you know wi-fi um now with that indian perspective that i've just shared with you it's uh, important to understand that the role of wi-fi in education is to provide collaborative immersive learning experience while improving the student life student improving the students learning and improving the student safety we'll touch upon it that how how is this accomplished uh, a statistic in front of you is that 46% of the entire world population currently is not connected to the internet. 
and a majority of them are school age children right so we have that huge digital divide that is yet to be covered uh, because uh, of wifi not permeating to all these school age children and i believe that wifi 6 the latest you know generation of wifi plays a critical role in in achieving that all right um so uh Wi-Fi six in education, right? It addresses. Uh, I think fundamentally, it addresses the need of a a smart campus, right? Uh, if you talk about uh, any smart campus, I think there are three objectives that that Wi-Fi solves for us. One is that uh, it helps in streamlining administration. Any sort of technology onboarding is streamlined. Any sort of process modernization is streamlined. Facilities management and staffing management is streamlined. and at the same time you end up enhancing education you are providing the the student an immersive learning experience using virtual reality and augmented reality and we're not talking about something one year down the line this is something that we have actually implemented uh, for our customer right uh, we want to give the customer we want to give the student an ability to do synchronous learning and asynchronous learning by giving them digital resource assets which they can access at any time and the third one is of course the smart campus which means that we provide students ubiquitous connectivity we provide faculty and visitors ubiquitous connectivity while ensuring their safety and security um now uh, here is an interesting fact uh, on an average for any given college or educational institutes a student connecting up to 7 wifi devices on the on the college wifi network up to seven devices per student right and when you think of it it comprises of their laptop uh their smartphone tablet they'll end up having some sort of a kindle or a ebook reader they'll have a ps3 or some sort of a gaming device they might come with their uh, you know their google chromecast or some other kind of uh, streaming media device they'll have their smart watches they'll have an alexa echo or a, or some sort of a voice control speaker and then they'll come up with their oculus you know ar or or vr headsets right so uh, so not only the students but even the campus even the 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 facilities management is now switching to iot to improve student experiences which means that we require a wifi technology which can ensure greater capacity greater efficiency and higher performance for high speed network access so that all these critical functions are not affected and also the personal and entertainment devices of uh, of the users get streamless uh, you know uh, get a streamlined experience all right so here is an analogy where we're trying to compare a campus of a college of a university or a school to a smart city if you think of it a college is almost like a smart city right because they are typically maintaining their own facilities they've got their building management they've got their waste management security management recycling and the student population per se expects to be connected at all times right which means that we have to solve three critical problems for this for this smart city number one we want to make sure that the education outcomes are improved if they want if some sort of uh, you know training requires augmented reality or virtual reality the network should not should not be a bottleneck number two is their uh, their security systems should be upgraded right which means that all these buildings should be equipped with smart access controls uh, they should be equipped with interconnected security cameras which can count people which can you know do facial recognition and it can count how many people are coming in and going out and then they can leverage these you know all these seven devices per user and start sending out emergency notifications if that's required not only that imagine the use of wifi for energy conservation right so all these you know buildings have sensors connected around them the facility managers can you know turn on the hvac the heating ventilation and cooling systems on and off centrally they can turn on the lighting in the building centrally which can result in uh, an efficient energy savings uh, they can set up outdoor environmental sensors so that they can track and control emissions like gas and smoke etc and even outdoor lighting for example they can illuminate pathways at pre-programmed times to improve uh, uh, energy efficiency and student safety so um 
All right. So let's talk about Wi-Fi 6 as a primer, right? I'm. This isn't a, a deep down hardcore technical session, but I'd like to give you a perspective of uh, of where we are in terms of Wi-Fi 6. Uh, 2009 is when uh, 802.11n came in. 2014 is when 802.11ac came in. And uh, 2019 is when the then the 802.11ax uh, got ratified, right? So what they've done is what the powers that be, which is the Wi-Fi Alliance, what they've done is they've simplified the name in the, the name of the nomenclature. 802.11n is called Wi-Fi 4, AC is called Wi-Fi 5, and uh, AX is called Wi-Fi 6, right? Uh, 802.11n could offer maximum theoretical data rates of around 600 Mbps. Um, 802.11ac could offer uh, uh, 6900 100 Mbps, which is 6.3 uh, Gbps, and uh, and Wi-Fi 6 can offer 9.6 uh, Gbps of throughput, right? So every single iteration of of Wi-Fi brings about improvements in uh, security, brings about improvements in mobility, and brings about improvements in ease of use. Now. You would think that, you know, from 6.9 Gbps to to 9.6 Gbps, that really isn't that much of a data rate improvement, is it? Uh, but it's but Wi-Fi 6 per se was not aimed at only improving. Ten percent. What they've done is they've improved the overall throughput of the network by 400 percent, right? And not just that, they've improved or lowered the latency of the network by 75%. The objective of Wi-Fi 6 was that even if many devices get connected onto the network, the overall performance of the network doesn't go down. So basically any environment which has got a dense number of users coming in, that becomes the ideal candidate for Wi-Fi 6. Educational institutes, corporate offices, uh, you know, dense residen residential apartments. All these are typical candidates for a good Wi-Fi 6 implementation. All right. So what do we know so far? Wi-Fi 6 is came out in 2019. Wi-Fi 6 leverages 2.4 gigahertz of spectrum and it uses 5 gigahertz of spectrum, right? It gives you overall throughput improvement. The, the nominal data rate improvement is not very high, but the throughput when multiple devices get connected is very high, right? So no new spectrum was introduced. We are leveraging the existing D license frequencies of 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz to see such kind of improvements. Now, you know, before we talk about uh, the deployment that we did for this customer, I want to talk about the next avatar of Wi-Fi 6, which is called Wi-Fi 6E. So Wi-Fi 6E, you know, is backward compatible with, uh, with 6 and 5, etc. But what it does is it opens up a brand new spectrum for six gigahertz. So Wi-Fi 6 was five gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. Let me write this down, right? So Wi-Fi 6 was 2.4 gigahertz and it was five gigahertz, right? Now Wi-Fi 6E is actually, it runs on 2.4 and 5, but it also leverages six gigahertz of frequency, right? Which basically means that imagine that you've got a very congested highway and the traffic police wala now opens a brand new channel for you. It opens up a brand new road for you where you get lesser interference, you get gigabit speeds, you get extremely low latency and you get very, very high capacity, right? So it's a brand new uh, de-licensed de channel. Now the problem is this channel of six gigahertz is yet to be ratified in India, right? You may be getting devices, right? For example, an iPhone 12 supports Wi-Fi 6, right? Uh, new generations of iPhone, iPhone may support Wi-Fi 6E, but you can't use it in India currently because uh, as per the frequency allocation plan of 2018, this frequency of 6 gigahertz has been allocated to fixed mobile and satellite services. So unless the Department of Telecom de-licenses this frequency, we cannot use it, which is, which is bad because it puts a full stop for for other innovation, innovative uh, you know, solutions that can come up for education, uh, manufacturing, and exports. So just wanted to share that perspective with you that uh, the difference between Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E. 
Um, now, uh, what's the now? Let's now talk about uh, you know if you're planning a Wi-Fi six implementation, right? You could be two different kind of personas. You could be the actual decision maker, or you could be the Wi-Fi consultant. We'll spend the next five to ten minutes assuming you're the decision maker, and then we'll switch over and assume that you're the consultant. All right. Um, now there's a proverb in the in the army which says, uh, "What are the five P's for success?" The five P's for success are uh, uh, proper planning prevents poor performance. Right. So if you planned well, uh, if you spent you know enough time planning your implementation, things should go relatively smoothly. Now, um, uh, let's imagine that you are the decision maker. Uh, should you consider, uh, you know, calling somebody, calling a Wi-Fi consultant uh, to uh, to analyze your requirements? I think you should, um, you know, because a Wi-Fi consultant has gone through the trenches. He's been there, done that. He has an understanding, or she has an understanding of how to, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of set really realistic expectations of of your needs and wants, and then convert them into a solution, right? So when you prepare for this meeting with your Wi-Fi consultant, be prepared that the following points will come up. That person is going to ask you for your floor plans. All right, he's going to ask you what your building structure is. Give me your CAD diagram, your AutoCAD diagram for every single floor. They're going to ask you which areas do not require Wi-Fi, right? So that access points need not be deployed there. Uh, they're going to ask you a question as to what type of Wi-Fi do you require? Do you require it for internal users? Or external users, do you require for both of them? And then what what timeline do you have in mind? Right? You ask for Wi-Fi from your service provider from Airtel or BSNL, and they'll provide it to you within five working days, and they'll set up a router in your place, and boom, your Wi-Fi enabled. But setting up Wi-Fi for an enterprise campus or a large educational institute takes some time. It's a it's a long drawn process. It can take months to complete. Right? So one of the answers that you should have is. What are the timelines that you have in mind to set up, uh, you know, Wi-Fi for your campus? Another question that will come up is, do you have existing Wi-Fi in your facility? If so, what technology are you using? Are you using Wi-Fi 4? Are you using Wi-Fi 5? How many users are there? Um, what kind of locations do you require Wi-Fi in? You don't require it in certain secretive places, but you require it in the common areas, indoor, outdoor, etc. And what kind of devices do you require? You know, what kind of devices typically connect? Are these Windows machines? Are these Android phones? Are these iPhones, etc.? So some bit of conversation will be around the kind of devices that will be connecting to Wi-Fi. All right. Another question that will come up is that what will be will the Wi-Fi be used for? Will it be upstream traffic? Will it be downstream traffic? Will there be a lot of multicast traffic? Will there be a lot of broadcast traffic, etc., uh, etc.? Et then there'll be question around uh, what kind of compliance requirements do you have for Wi-Fi? Is there some sort of a regulatory compliance for which uh, you know those guidelines need to be incorporated in the Wi-Fi design, right? HIPAA or PCI, etc. Uh, another point that will come up will be redundancy requirements, right? Do you want 99.999% redundancy, or are you okay with 99.99 redundancy? That kind of a conversation will come up. There'll be a concept that you require VAS, right? W A A S. Right, which is Wi-Fi as a service. Do you want somebody else to completely operate and manage the entire Wi-Fi solution for you, or do you have an in-house team who will who will provide uh, you know services to you to operate and manage the entire environment? All right. So these are some of the questions that can come up uh, when you're preparing for uh, for a meeting with a Wi-Fi consultant. Um, let's see if there are any questions here that we should answer. I'm going to take a brief moment to see if there are any questions out here. Right, Nikhil says there's no voice. You can't. There's no voice. Is that still the case, uh, Nikhil or anybody? Can you confirm? Are you able to hear me? Shweta, I'm getting a message that there's no voice. Can you please confirm? Okay, good, loud and clear. Thank you, thank you, Hikmat. Okay. Uh, all right, so I might be preaching to the choir here, right? Uh, what are the basic parts of a, of a wireless network, right? What are the basic moving parts? You've got your access points, which we'll call as AP, right? That's the that's the actual device to which your, your endpoints will be connecting, your phones and your tablets, etc. will be connecting to. Then there'll be a concept called a wireless LAN controller, right? This wireless LAN controller can be either hardware or software. 
It can be either on site in your campus or it can be in the cloud. The objective of the, the wireless LAN controller is basically management and, and control of all your APs. Imagine that if you have to change a setting and you've got 500 APs, you wouldn't want to log into 500 APs to make the change, right? So that's why you require a, wi a wireless LAN controller uh, to make changes to you know hundreds and thousands of APs. The third thing that you'd require is network switches, right? These are the devices to which your APs get connected. And typically these switches are, are you know, sending out POE, which is power over Ethernet, which means that if you have an AP and if you've, you've got a switch, you don't want to run two wires to the to the AP. You don't want a power cable to the AP and you don't want a data cable to the AP. You just want one wire that will be running the power also and the data also, right? And then you'd want to have a device called a firewall or some sort of a security device which makes sure that you're protected from the bad, bad world of the internet, right? Some sort of a, a device at the vanguard of the internet and you, right? And then of course you've got your Wi-Fi enabled devices, your phones, tablets, you know, and your and your uh, and your uh, uh, you know laptops, etc. And finally, you'd want to have something to connect to. You'd, you'd want to have an internet service. Now I know uh, you know there, there are people out here who will say that that's not the only part of a Wi-Fi network, right? You have not talked about a WIPs. You've not talk, talked about a wireless intrusion prevention system. You've not talked about a NAC, which is a network access control system. You haven't talked about an NMS, which is a network management system. You haven't talked about the AI and ML kind of engines, which can be responsible for wayfinding and pinpointing where a certain user is using Bluetooth low energy. But that's true, right? I mean, that's definitely there. I just wanted to kind of set the stage for uh, for the basic you know, moving parts of a wireless network before before I proceed further and talk about my my next slide, which is you don't put, uh, you know, the cart in front of the horse. You put the horse in front of the cart. Right. Uh, so what do I mean by that? You know, there have been times when I meet a customer and I try to uh, I try to articulate the importance of Wi-Fi. And then he says, Mota Mota, can you tell me how many APs do I require? Right. He wants to do a quick and dirty calculation and say, okay, 25,000 rupees per AP multiplied by 100 is equal to what, 25 lakh rupees? That's my budgetary, right? Uh, bad idea, bad idea, right? You don't make a purchase decision until you do a site survey. You don't make a purchase decision until you do a site survey. You have to ask core design questions before you move forward, right? You have to ask, what am I trying to accomplish here? Who's the who's the Wi-Fi for? Is it for the CIO? Is it for the CTO? Um, am I only providing guest access? Am I providing production access? Am I providing a captive portal wherein somebody has to log into a web page? Only then he'll be allowed inside. Am I providing capacity and throughput? Am I providing only coverage so that Wi-Fi I'm not bothered about capacity, or do I want capacity and coverage both? Right. So until you have answers to these questions. Do not jump the gun and make a purchase decision. We have seen multiple deployments uh, fail in the past and you end up saving a lot of money and saving a lot of time if you do a site survey before you make a purchase decision. So you put the horse before the cart. All right. Now, there have been times when when uh, you know customers still bought the budgetary for me and because of lack of uh, um, you know, lack of uh, convincing skills, I have to give them a perspective, right? So I'm going to share that perspective with you, right? How many APs would you require? That's the question. How many APs do you require for your campus? Here is my standard answer. If you have got a 40 feet by 40 feet room, right? If you've got a 40 feet by 40 feet room, that's around 1600 square feet, go in for one AP, right? One access point for six to 1600 square foot or one access point for 30 users. If you want a ballpark, use this ballpark for your for your quick and dirty you know, calculations. That said, understand that Wi-Fi signals are consumed by walls. They're consumed by the floor, right? So uh, for example, let's imagine that I've given you this number, right? 1600 square feet, uh, one AP. I'm assuming that when you look at your windows bottom right hand side, you see those bars. You see that Wi-Fi bar. Four bars is equal to uh, minus 67 dBm of signal, right? Which is considered good, right? So if you want four bars, one AP for 1600 users or one AP, sorry, one AP for 1600 square feet or one AP for 30 users. But if you've got a concrete wall somewhere in between or if you've got a brick wall, 
decrease that number by half. One brick wall will consume around eight dBs of signal. One concrete wall will consume 12 dBs of signal. Um, one heavy door, right? One big fat door uh, will end up consuming around 15 uh, dBs of signal, right? So ballpark, you know, divide that number by half. If you've got brick walls as opposed to the, that uh, drywall, assume one AP for 800 square feet, right? Now that said, right, as I said, this is ballpark. If you have to arrive at the accurate number for how many access points you require, here is what you require to do. Number one, you will have to understand what is the total throughput that you'd want to offer your users, right? For example, I know that my users are doing a lot of video conferencing, video streaming. I want to give them at least two Mbps of throughput, right? So first of all, get an understanding of what is the per user throughput, number one. Number two, understand how many users are going to be there. Third thing that you have to understand is the take rate. I'll spell it out here, take rate. Take rate is also referred to as adoption rate, that how many of those users will actually be logging on to the Wi-Fi, right? The fourth thing that you need to understand is that out of this total take rate, how many users are actually active and concurrent at any given point of time? And finally, when you have this number, once you have this number, you have to determine the RF efficiency, which means that what will be the total target throughput that you will provide per access point, right? So that's the calculation that you have to do. Total number of users, how many of them are logging on to the access point, how many are concurrent at any given point of time, and what is the total throughput per AP, right? You cannot get answers to these questions unless you do a good quality design session with your Wi-Fi consultant, right? So that, that's why we have to put the, the horse before the cart, all right? Um, now, before moving for, you know, forward well, to talk about the Wi-Fi deployment, uh, and, and what a good Wi-Fi deployment looks like. Let's talk about what a bad Wi-Fi deployment looks like, right? Uh, right. So if you if you've done poor AP placement, right? If you've not placed your access points correctly, here is something that you have to be prepared for. You will be pre you have to be prepared for low data rates, which is low throughput. You will be prepared. You have to be prepared for something called uh, signal bleeding, right? Signal bleeding basically means that two APs which were meant to be you know, separated, which are using the same frequency and the same channel are doing CCI, which stands for co-channel interference, right? Another problem that you will face is bad roaming coverage. You are moving from one location to the other and your Wi-Fi signal drops. To solve these problems, what you'll end up doing is you'll end up spending a lot of money to buy additional access points. The point is that spending that additional money might also not solve your problem because the problem is fundamentally bad design, right? So uh, I'll give you an example of bad design, right? This was one customer. They called us for a brownfield implementation. They said, here is a challenge that we are facing. The challenge was that this user is getting four bars, right? On your, on your bottom, on your windows, you get four bars. The so four or five bars, but still they're not able to communicate with the network. The throughput is pathetic, right? So that was the problem statement, right? Now, interestingly, the problem that we eventually found was that they had said the transmit power of their access points to the highest, right? That logically doesn't make sense, does it? An access point with high transmit power should mean that everybody should be able to connect to it. But the challenge here was that Wi-Fi is a two-way communication, right? And a client talks to AP and AP talks to client. So while the powerful access point is sending, you know, sending its, uh, you know, signal down to the AP, uh, to the client, no problem. The client, your iPhone or Android phone does not have that kind of a powerful antenna or that kind of a powerful radio. So the signal was not reaching, the client signal was not reaching the AP. This concept is referred to as fake coverage, fake coverage, right? So what ends up happening is that you have a, a client which thinks he's connected to a very good access point. And because he's connected to that access point, he's sending data at a very slow rate. That causes two problems. Problem number one, this one client suffers. But because of this one client, every other client also suffers. Because Wi-Fi is a shared medium. You cannot talk unless I'm done talking, 
I cannot talk until you are done talking, right? It's a it's a concept referred to as half duplex. It's not a full duplex medium. Now, eight zero two dot eleven AC basically brought about a concept called mu mimo, right? I'll write it down here: M U M I M O, which means multiple users, multiple input, multiple output, which means that the access point can talk to multiple clients simultaneously, right? And eight zero two dot eleven AX, which is Wi-Fi six, brought about this concept of multiple clients also be to be able to you know talk to the AP simultaneously, right? So multiple spatial streams are crossing each other. But that said, multiple APs can talk to mul can talk to the uh, sorry, an AP can talk to multiple clients, and multiple clients can talk to the AP. But at any given point of time, the AP and client cannot talk to each other at the same time. It's RTS. CTS request to send, clear to send, right? So unless you are clear to send, you can't send anything. So we go back to our our original problem statement. I am a user. I am connected on a bad AP. Why is it a bad AP? Because it's sending out very very high throughput. It's sending out a, a very excellent RSSI, which is the received signal strength indicator. It is a bad AP because I am too far away from it, right? And when I am sending traffic to it, my traffic is slow, and because of that, every other Other person has to wait until I send my data, right? So that's what brings the entire communication down to a grinding halt, right? Uh, not only that, imagine that I am sitting in room one, the AP that I'm connected to is in room five, right? But because the signal of that AP is so strong, I am not able to connect to the room to the AP which is in room one. So if I were to disconnect from that, I could have easily gotten better speeds, right? But because I'm still hooked on to the to the far away AP, I'm not able to connect to the near end AP. All right. So fake coverage means slower networks. It means failure to roam. It means that there'll be a signal overload. Every one in the network is going to suffer. Right. And this is a typical example of uh, of bad design. Too many access points using a uh, high power bombarding each other. Everything, every single device has to listen to the radio waves. That's a concept referred to as CSMA CA, carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. Everyone has to wait for each other to stop talking, and that's what creates a lot of problems. So, which is why you know, if you have a bad network design, you may have spent a lot of money to solve the problem. If you spend any more money to buy more APs, even that will not solve the problem. You require somebody who can come in and diagnose the problem for you, and maybe they'll be able to solve it with your existing network paraphernalia. All right. Um, let's now talk about the phases of a Wi-Fi deployment. Right. A typical Wi-Fi deployment has got four phases. Right. Phase number one is that uh, you know a Wi-Fi consultant and you will be doing requirement gathering. Right. We'll sit together. We'll create a project plan. We'll do a site a site survey questionnaire, and then we'll set expectations as to what we're trying to achieve. Right. The second objective is going to be site design. Now, this is interesting, right? What I could do is I could ask you for your your CAD files, your your AutoCAD files, and I can load it onto a software which will plot access points on this CAD diagram, right? There are beautiful softwares like Ekahow. Uh, there is Air Magnet. There is IB Wave. There are multiple softwares available which can help you do a predictive site survey. By sitting remotely, I'm not even at the site where you are. I can get your AutoCAD diagram and I can plot what the heat map will look like. Uh, after a few slides, I will show you the heat maps that we prepared for our customer and how we plotted out the access points for classrooms, for laboratories, for the gymnasium, for the uh, for the common areas, for the for the stadium, etc. We'll go through that uh, shortly, right? So that's what the site design is all about. There'll be a time when I will be expected to come to your site with an actual AP on stick. So it's called AP OS, right? It's called AP OS S, AP on a stick survey. So what I'll do is I'll take a stick, a physical stick, I'll mount an access point on top, I'll connect it to a battery pack, and then I'll actually start figuring out that where is the attenuation happening through a drywall, through a brick wall, through a window, through a wireframe. So I can do a you know a survey for you to understand where I should be I should be physically placing the APs once you once you and I start working to, together for the Wi-Fi design, right? Now the third part of the uh, of the entire project is the configuration and installation where we install the Wi-Fi equipment, we do the IP addressing, we integrate it with your uh, you know with your other paraphernalia, 
and then we end up you know tweaking the paraphernalia right for example wifi isn't the only thing that you that you, that you have in the network right there's your dns dhcp servers your network access control systems your captive portals etc that entire service tuning up has to happen and finally we have to train your users if you decide to go for the vas model which is the wifi as a service model we become your your service providers for for ensuring that your slas are met uh, in terms of wifi uh, in a scenario wherein you have your existing team we train them we empower them so that they can handle the wifi uh, network on their own independently all right so four phases of a wifi deployment um, now let's have a look at the timelines what are the typical timelines that you're looking for for a decent sized um, educational institute right uh, keep in mind that it's a detailed activity it starts with requirement gathering uh, so assume around 2 weeks for requirement gathering assume maybe around 3 weeks for the design phase where we create the hld the high level design the low level design documentation phase 3 is going to be the actual build right sorry phase 3 is going to be the budget Uh, the budget process time where we're going to be you know sharing the budgetary estimates with you you know you'll be getting approvals for that and once that once that is done we will place the order with the oems right so we've got you know connects with various oems arista cisco microtech uh, you, know, you know then there is uh, Ar- aruba ubiquity so multiple oems that we have tie ups with we can reach out to them and get a commitment as to when we'll get these aps onboarded so we can start implementing uh around 2 to 2 and a half months for implementation and uh, post installation another 2 3 weeks followed by acceptance and sign off so we are looking at around 180 days 6 months for a decent sized wireless project to be implemented now if your campus or if your area is more than uh, 10 lakh square feet it will take yet longer right so just i just want to set expectations that that's the kind of timeline that we are talking about around 6 months to to implement a decent wifi network design all right uh let's pause here for a minute because i'm you know covering coming to my favorite part of the slide show which you know which basically talks about what are the best practices that you have to keep in mind when when placing access points let me see if there are any questions that we can answer All right no questions as of now okay so uh what is the meaning of good ap placement right um it's it's a fairly simple answer why can't i just place a an ap as a wall clock right why can't i just place an ap under my desk right what is the the definition of good access point placement the definition of good access point placement means that once you've placed these access points you will ensure adequate coverage for all your clients you will ensure adequate capacity or adequate throughput for all your clients you will ensure that they have good connectivity without fluctuation and you will ensure that you have minimal interference between two access points that's the definition of good access point placement right i'll give you an example of what i mean by this right um yeah so imagine that you have a uh, you know a ceiling right and in the ceiling you've got these uh, you know gypsum tiles right gypsum or asbestos tiles and you end up placing an ap here right below the the asbestos tile right is that a better design should you be actually placing the ap below the below the tile or on top of the tile you know logically one would say that put it on top what difference will it make right um because you'll end up avoiding a possible possibility of theft if you pay you know place it on top of the tile now the problem is that if you place it on top uh your ap gets affected by other environmental factors for example ducting power cables other construction material if you place it below the asbestos or the gypsum tile you get a cleaner environment you get a climate controlled environment which means your access points last longer if you were to do a, a test right if you were to place an ap below the asbestos or if you were to place it above the asbestos what you'll find is that if you place it below invariably you'll get better download speeds better upload speeds better ping responses and lower jitter all right um another thumb rule that you have to remember is that place the aps as close to the users as possible right 
you'll find a lot of deployments wherein you're actually placing APs uh, uh, in the hallways, right? Uh, there have been times when we have also done this. The customer has categorically told us, you place it in the hallways, give me yellow wala signal in the in the rooms, I'm fine. Yellow wala signal is that you give me decent coverage there, but uh, I don't want the chance of vandalization. Somebody inside the room can, you know, take out the AP and run away with it, right? So it's more efficient to place the signal as close to the device who's going to access the signal, all right? Um, in a cubicle area, like in a large office, you know, use a concept referred to as a honeycomb design, right? Use a concept referred to as a honeycomb design, right? So place it like this, right? Um, create a honeycomb, right? And make sure that this AP and this AP and this AP are not on the same channel, right? This concept of honeycomb design basically ensures that there's no CCI or no co-channel interference. Now, important point, let's imagine that you've got the honeycomb for the for only the, the horizontal ground floor. You also have to keep in mind that the signal from the ground floor can percolate from the concrete and go to the first floor, right? So if I were to use uh, a different colored pen, Right. So if the red colored signifies uh, the red colored signifies um, uh, the ground floor. You'd want to make sure that your first floor honeycomb is also different from your ground floor honeycomb. Right. So your honeycomb or your staggering has to keep in mind not only vertical straggling, uh, uh, vertical staggering, but even horizontal staggering. All right. So that you can make sure that there's no signal leaking from 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 one floor to another. All right. Avoid obstructions. If you see an exit sign, you know, don't keep the AP right next to the exit sign. You will end up, you know, creating a blockage for the signal. Any sort of fluorescent light, any sort of fluorescent light, right? For example, if you're seeing me right now and if you're seeing any light flickering, right? That I mean, I don't have fluorescent lights. I have, I have LED lights in my place, but fluorescent lights have known to be, you know, problems which create interference for for wireless signals, right? So avoid using, uh, you know, placing APs very next to, to fluorescent lights. If possible, at least keep it one tile away, all right? Keep an access point away from a motor. Keep it away from a shaft. A typical radio jamming device is a motor. Try and keep it next to the elevator, see what happens. Uh, how many of us face the problem of saying, bhai, my lift, mein ho, my lift, mein ho, my, uh, no call cut jayegi, right? Because the motor acts like a jamming device, right? It takes away all your Wi-Fi signal. So, you know, try not to keep it too close to a motor. Uh, try not to keep it in a, in, a, uh, in a metal casing. There is a concept referred to as a Faraday cage effect. So in a Faraday cage effect, if you create it around, if you place an AP around a wire mesh, uh, the wire mesh will take away all the signals. It will not be able to come out, right? So avoid doing that. Uh, avoid keeping uh, access points at waist level because then they become a typical candidate for, uh, for uh, you know, uh, vandalism. Uh, you know, A loves B, whatever, you know, somebody will start scribbling things on it or it'll end up becoming, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a candidate for theft, right? There was this customer down south who had a very peculiar requirement that they wanted uh, their access points to be in gold color. So because the entire building decor was gold, right? So, I mean, aesthetic, con you know, considerations play a role, right? Uh, as to what your, uh, what your AP should look like, right? So, um, Another point to keep in mind is that don't try to keep your access points too close to the outside walls, because if you do that, you're creating two problems. One, your access points are bleeding signal outside. That's inefficient because they should be bleeding signal inside. Second problem is that now people outside have a potential vector to come inside, right? That, you know, unknown threat vectors can potentially use that access point signal to try and penetrate your network, right? So good wireless design requires to make sure that your APs are not mounted too close to the outside walls, right? Um, plan for higher users, right? If you have a large meeting room, more APs, right? You know that eventually this will be this room will have a lot of people, so plan for more APs in that meeting room, all right? Roaming, plan for roaming if roaming is a requirement, right? Um, if roaming is a requirement, then good implement roaming 
keep at least a 15%, 1-5, 15% overlap. So if you create a Venn diagram of the signals between AP1 and AP2, at least keep a 15% overlap between them, but ensure that they're not talking on the same channel. If they're talking on the same channel, they will bring down the SNR, they'll bring down the signal to noise ratio, and they'll create CCI, which is co-channel interference. Um, outdoor access points, right? Uh, when you're putting outdoor access points, make sure that these outdoor APs have an IP rating, right? For example, my, my Bluetooth headphones have an IP65 rating. So similarly, your outdoor APs have also got an IP rating. If you have got a lower IP rating, then you have to develop casing around the AP to, you know, to protect it from rain and temperature. Keep in mind, uh, you know, grounding. For example, there have been times when a customer has actually, dug, you know, dug uh, a 20-foot hole in the ground put copper plates inside it, and then use proper shielding of, uh, you know, cables and connectors to connect it to the access points, you know, so that transient connection current is passed down to the ground, right? Quality of power is important. If there's a diesel generator powering the AP, and if it's sending out bad sine waves, your access point connection to your end user will suffer, all right? Uh, are your APs getting powered on using solar power? Do they have that solar power panels on top? If yes, you may want to invest in a battery backup just in case if the juice dies out. All right. Um, another concept that we talk about is a concept referred to as a drip loop. Drip loop, right? Imagine uh, you know that a cable wala at your house is connecting a cable, and it's you know right at the wall. You would have seen that he creates this kind of a loop, right? This loop is called a drip loop, which means that if rainwater or if any sort of water comes trickling down this entire water, uh, you know, on this wire, it drips here before it enters your electrical paraphernalia, right? So a lot of times we've seen that you've got a very straight cable, there's no drip loop, and the wire uh, and the data, uh, and the, the water enters inside the ruggedized uh, SFP over time and then spoils it, right? So these are some of the things that you have to keep in mind when uh, when doing good AP placement, both from an indoor perspective as well as from an outdoor perspective. All right. Um, Seventy percent of a Wi-Fi consultant's time, in my opinion, should go into the site survey. Right. If I'm your Wi-Fi consultant, once the Wi-Fi survey is complete, I should be able to answer the following questions. I should know how many clients are there? How many clients are there who will connect to me today? And how many will connect to me in the future? I should be able to answer what is the exact right access point that you're going to choose, right? I will give you options. If you want a cheaper access point, I could make a recommendation. If you want a, uh, uh, if you want, uh, you know, longer lasting access point, I could give you options, but I'd want to know exactly which access point we're going to implement. I should be able to tell you exactly how many number of access points I'm going to implement. I should be able to pinpoint where I will be placing my APs. I should know what the configuration of the APs would be from a transmit power perspective, from an SSID perspective, from a channel perspective, from a channel width perspective. I should know how many switches I'm going to implement, which will be terminating these APs. I should know what kind of cables I'm going to use between the AP and the switch. I should know the number of cables which are going to connect the switch in the AP. And I should also know what kind of a Vanguard device or router or firewall I'll be using to connect all these APs to the internet, right? To do this, in order to do this, I have to establish a baseline, right? As a consultant, I'll be speaking to you and asking you questions and setting a baseline that what will be your top network users? What will be your peak time? At what time are you expecting the maximum traffic? What will be the total traffic per node? Broadcast traffic, unicast traffic, and multicast traffic. How much of your traffic is going from van to LAN or LAN to van? And how much of it is LAN to LAN, right? Are you doing more uploads? Are you doing more downloads, right? I will need to get a baseline for that so that I can measure my performance once I've implemented your Wi-Fi network I will use this baseline to measure whether I was able to successfully achieve the requirement of the site survey or not, right? So that's the objective of a site survey. Solidify requirements, set expectations, and know what to look out for when you do the validation of the entire Wi-Fi network, all right? 
um tailor master is going to you know if you ask him you know what is the concept of a good design uh, measure twice cut once right you uh, you know as a as a wifi consultant if i ask you for a cat diagram and if you give me a cat diagram um and it has got a, a drywall in it i'm going to factor for a drywall i know that my wifi signal will will attenuate by 3 dbs right but eventually if it ends up being a brick wall my wifi signal will attenuate 8 dbs right so garbage in garbage out if that diagram is incorrect my topology will be incorrect if that diagram is incorrect your wifi design will be bad so typically when we do a wifi survey we don't only do a predictive survey we follow it up with an active survey on your site right we come there to your site and do a proper survey to make sure that we measure twice and then cut only once right the next thing is that we plan for the future we plan that what will be your future projects going to be like what kind of new applications you will come that will come on board what kind of traffic flows will come on board so that we you know we not only focus on the current max capacity we focus on the projected max capacity all right um cyber security needs right so cyber security should not be an afterthought right we want to make sure that if you if this is a guest wifi if he is visiting websites which can create problems for you later we want to disable those websites at our content filtering device we don't want to allow a guest to access websites which can create problems for you in the future right we want to ensure that the guest once he's logged in should not be able to access your email server right i want to quarantine him i want to block him to only be able to access what i want him to access right i would want to decide at what times i want to allow a guest at what times i do not want to allow a guest right even for a production vlan even for a production uh, you know access i want to be able to determine what one department will be able to access and what one department will not be able to access right so these are the kind of conversations that are thrashed out at the stage of a site survey right cyber security coverage and capacity now this is a, a relatively simple question to answer for some um when you design a wireless network you are asked a question right uh, do you want coverage or do you want capacity coverage means that my wifi should be available everywhere and capacity means that it should be very efficient if multiple users are are huddled around a corner they should get a good capacity right now you would obviously think that i will go for capacity right because then i'll automatically get coverage but some customers for some customers this need not be true it is true for education but for organizations such as manufacturing and warehousing where they typically have their barcode scanners for inventory etc they don't have a requirement for capacity they are more bothered about coverage right so uh, so just keep in mind that uh, your you know whether you are you know factoring for capacity or for coverage all right sorry i wasn't sharing the slide right capacity or coverage on the right hand side you see capacity multiple aps a uh, higher capex a uh, higher opex and on the left hand side you see a concept called coverage right where you've got lesser aps you've got that 15% uh, you know coverage between multiple aps so that roaming works but you're not bothered about too many users you know connecting to the ap at any given point of time all right um now as a part of your wifi design right remember i just said that you have to ask a question to the customer you have to ask them devices hai kaun se what kind of devices are connecting to your network are these android phones are these iphones are these you know windows laptops are these macbooks why is it important because this will determine what kind of ap models you will buy right if you do this calculation wrong you'll suffer in the future because what if you go for only 5 gigahertz aps but your clients can only support 2.4 gigahertz what happens in a scenario wherein uh, your aps do not support dfs right so what is dfs by the way um this 5 gigahertz channel has got a certain chunk of channels uh, the 5 gigahertz spectrum has got a chunk of channels called dfs uh, distributed frequency spectrum if i can remember the acronym correctly this dfs is basically used by naval dockyards right they used by radar so if an access point 
discovers that there's a radar nearby, it immediately stops using that DFS channel, right? But after 30 minutes, it tries again, right? So that's what a DFS channel is. Now, what if you have designed your entire solution for DFS channels, but your clients do not support it, right? Uh, what if your clients do not support 802.11n, but your entire design has been done for 802.11n? What if your assumption was that your clients will support mu MIMO, which is multiple user, multiple in, multiple out, but your design supports it, but your clients do not support it? Now, there is this website that I've mentioned here. It's called clients.mikealbano.com. If you go here, it will give you a perspective. It will tell you that uh, for every single device, more or less, I think a lot of devices are covered here, you know, Chromebook, Kindle, iPhone, Android, etc. It tells you that for every single device, which all channel it supports, whether it supports 802.11 AC, AX, or 802.11 N, whether it supports new MIMO or not, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you a beautiful understanding, which will empower you to design a Wi-Fi network correctly. All right, clients.michaelbano.com. You need not take notes. So for those of you who have registered and we have your email address as a part of the uh, thank you for, uh, notes for as at the end of this presentation, we will send you this slide deck. All right, so you'll have a copy of the slide deck as well. All right, um, going forward, uh, you know, apart from understanding the types of devices, get clarity as to the type of applications that will run on your Wi-Fi. If you're designing your Wi-Fi for email and web traffic, which is light and sporadic, it is completely different compared to a design which is focused around video surveillance, which is significant and constant stream of traffic. Video surveillance compared to, you know, voice over IP is again very different. Voice over IP traffic is, you know, low latency, it is, you know, benign traffic, which is very small in size, but it's got special design considerations around it. So understand the applications and the application flow when you are designing a Wi-Fi solution. Choose the, be choose the best APs. You know, uh, I often, you know, I met a customer uh, who, uh, you know, wanted to set up uh, a decent sized Wi-Fi, right, around 400 users. And what he ended up doing is he purchased a lot of these you know, Tenda and TP-Link and D-Link uh, endpoints. And he created a very heterogeneous kind of an environment around his office, right? Uh, now, imagine one day he had to change the, the pre-shared key. He had to change the password for uh, for his Wi-Fi. So he had, to, he had to log into these, you know, 90 or 80 odd, uh, you know, access points of different OEMs and change that password manually, right? So there is a difference between uh, enterprise access points and Soho which is small office, uh, home office access points. Um, uh, wherever possible, you know, spend money on the CapEx because it pays in the long run. It pays from a manageability perspective. It pays from a serviceability perspective. It pays from a throughput perspective. And it pays from a capacity perspective. And it pays from an aesthetics perspective also. These APs look definitely pretty. We'll show you some photographs of the APs that we deployed for, uh, for our customer shortly. All right. Um, all right. Now, uh, when you're planning, I remember I said there is a tool called Ekahau and Air Magnet and IB Wave. Uh, whenever you plan for a Wi-Fi, uh, you know, setup, let's imagine that I'm your Wi-Fi consultant and you're sitting in another part of the country or another part of the world. If you give me your AutoCAD diagrams, I can plot it on on this on this beautiful tool, and then it can give me a lot of great information. It can tell me, um, it can help us in increasing the confidence that eventually, when we actually do this implementation, it will turn out it will turn out right, right. So predictive analysis is the inception point for a for a good site survey, right. Now, if predictive analysis is the inception, the proof of the pudding is actually the validation serving. When everything is said and done, any Wi-Fi uh, consultant worth his salt will end up doing a post survey for you, right? He will end up doing an either an active survey or a passive survey, wherein he'll say that, see, this is what I had committed to you in the pre-installation stage, where in the, in the predictive analysis stage. And now I've used those benchmarks to compare to what we've done now. And Mr. Customer, Please understand that these were the identification sources. These were the interference sources that we had not identified earlier, right? So we've had to modify our network somewhat to 
to manage those interference sources, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very honest and transparent communication between a consultant and a customer during the post-validation uh, or the post-install validation phase, right? Um, a brief touch about, uh, you know, uh, channel considerations, right? Uh, I honestly thought that, you know, somebody will do away with the 2.5, uh, 2.4 gigahertz frequency, but apparently this Wi-Fi 6 is actually factored for 2.4 gigahertz frequency, so which means it's, it's here to stay for some time. I thought that this this spectrum is as it is so populated with you know your Bluetooth devices with your microwave ovens etc cetera, etc cetera, that we'll start sunsetting it after some time right but uh, at the same time just keep in mind that 2.4 gigahertz provides you better propagation and better penetration it can go through walls easier comparatively right so uh, and a 5 gigahertz means lesser propagation and lesser penetration but at the same time 2.4 gigahertz can only give you three. It can only give you three non-overlapping channels, right? So which is one, six, and 11. That's it. So when you're creating your honeycomb and there are three APs around you, you have to make sure that they are, they are all on these three different non-overlapping channels, right? If you end up using a 40 gigahertz, uh, sorry, a 40 megahertz wide band on 2.4 gigahertz, you only get two non-overlapping channels. So I repeat, 20 megahertz on a 2.4 gigahertz frequency, you get three non-overlapping channels. And 40, 40 megahertz on a 2.4 gigahertz channel, you end up getting only two non-overlapping channels, right? Now, five gigahertz solve this problem, right? If you if you assume that DFS is just a number, you know, DFS is just, is just a bunch of characters, you end up getting 25 non-overlapping channels for 5 gigahertz. 25 non-overlapping channels for 5 gigahertz on the 20 megahertz frequency. So 25 for 20, 20 megahertz, 13 for 40 megahertz, uh, 6 for 80 megahertz, and 2 uh, channels for 160 megahertz, right? So, so basically, Wi-Fi at 5 gigahertz means you get lesser propagation, you get lesser penetration, but at the same time, you get more non-overlapping channels. And 2.4 gigahertz, you get better propagation, you get better penetration, but that's a very crowded spectrum, right? Because of microwave, Bluetooth, et cetera, et cetera. All right. Um, Channel width consideration, right? Uh, you know, so 2.4 gigahertz only allows for 20 megahertz and 40 megahertz wide channels, and 5 gigahertz lets you go up to 160. Practically, 20 megahertz is the best option, in my opinion, because not only is it easier to find a clear channel, uh, you know, you are able to get more density, more power density, which means you get greater range. And because you're getting greater range, multiple devices or multiple APs are able to talk on different channels, which means you get lesser CCI, lesser co-channel interference, right? So 20 megahertz, 20 megahertz channels is what I would recommend uh, when you're planning your Wi-Fi implementation. Of course, your nuances could be different, you know, depending upon your nuances, we may have to look at, uh, you know, designing it differently, but for a typical use case, uh, 20 megahertz is okay, all right? Um, let's pause for a minute here to see if there are any questions and then we'll, we'll move on. All right, I can see that, uh, you know, there are a few questions from, uh, from Ritu, from Rajesh and, yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sana, for answering them. All right. Um, uh, I met a customer who said, I want a wife, I want an SSID for every single type of application. Printers ke liye alag de do, you know, scanners ke liye alag kar do, uh, building management system ke liye alag kar do, and different for voice, different for video, right? So, which is fine, right? It's, I mean, if your AP supports it, why not? But here is what you need to keep in mind, right? Each SSID requires the access point to advertise its presence. It sends out a beacon, right? Main yaan hu, main yaan, right? It sends out the beacon. Now that beacon is sent out every 100 milliseconds, all right? 
the access point is sending out this beacon every 100 milliseconds, right? Now, beacons are sent at a very, very low data rate, right? To ensure that all clients can hear it, right? So they send out at a, at a very, very low data rate. Now, remember what I said, that Wi-Fi is a shared medium, which means that one guy is talking, everybody has to listen. So when beacons are sent out at low data rates, when a beacon is being sent out, nobody can talk, right? So if there are many beacons, there'll be many, many messages at low data rate taking up valuable airtime, right? As a rule of thumb, don't go beyond four SSIDs or don't go beyond, beyond four Wi-Fi's per AP, right? If you do that, uh, even four SSIDs will mean that you are reducing the effective airtime usable for data by more than 50%, right? So punchline, fewer SSIDs means more capacity. All right, fewer SSIDs means more capacity. We now talk about the customer, right? Let's talk about the customer for whom we did, did, did this implementation. This customer had a, a requirement of setting up a 47 acre smart campus, right? With a focus on uh, e-learning and educational tools, right? The customer had a requirement of uh, using immersive technologies like augmented reality, and virtual reality to impart education, right? What kind of education? So they were basically into, you know, the hydro, you know, the hydrocarbon sector, you know, basically providing vocational training around petrochemicals, plastics, general, you know, engineering, green energy, you know, sustainable energy, um, you know, information technology, language labs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it was, you know, primarily focused on uh, vocational training. It's an NGO. It's a non you know, not-for-profit, uh, you know, organization, right? And they had thousands of students coming in and getting all this learning, right? And what was beautiful about uh, this customer is that they had a placement cell for helping these uh, these uh, students get placed into various organizations, but they also had a startup incubation center so as to, you know, uh, promote entrepreneurship on for everybody who studies with them. So, that's what the customer is, right? They, they had a vision of setting up this uh, 47 acre smart campus, right? Um, fairly straightforward requirement. They wanted uh, a staff SSID. So for all the staff and faculty, they wanted dot one X authentication with Active Directory, right? And then they had a guest SSID. The guest SSID basically had that captive portal, right? You enter your tele your your email address, your your details here, and somebody's going to approve your access, right? So unless somebody approves, we'll not let you in, right? And once even if you're approved, you're quarantined to access only certain things, right? So that was the second requirement. The third one was they wanted a student SSID. So a student SSID also gets uh, you know, authenticated using dot one X and uh, an active directory credentials. And they had a very interesting requirement. They said that student SSID for the academic block where the children are studying should be different compared to the student SSID in hostel. So that cert certain social media access or certain certain social media websites can be blocked so that, you know, children can focus on studies when they're in the academic block. Right. So. Um, Right, so that was the basic requirement from a wireless perspective, and at least from phase one, this phase one perspective, they did not want to incorporate their IoT and their building management systems and their printers and scanners and CCTV. They didn't want to latch them on to the to the wireless network, right? Uh, here is the institute, right? So, I mean, on the top you see a picture of of them taken during the daytime, and the bottom you see a picture of them taken during nighttime. Beautiful facility um, that they had. Um, what equipment did we finally choose after doing a site survey? So we uh, once we did a predictive survey for this customer, here is the equipment that we finally zeroed down to, right? Around 400 access points, right? Around 400 access points were implemented. And we literally threw the entire kitchen sink of technology to them. So there was not just Wi-Fi, there was, you know, video surveillance. And those video surveillance had those cameras which can count the number of people who are going from location X to location Y. So these, these are smart cameras that we implemented for them. And we implemented latest routers and, uh, you know, next generation firewalls for them, as well as uh, network access control. Who you are, when you're logging in, how you're logging in determines what you can do, right? So that's what network access control is. And you also set up, you know, video conferencing uh, for this customer. But the conversation that you and I are having right now on this session is about, uh, is about wireless LAN. So we'll talk about the wireless LAN equipment that we used. Uh, 
we implement so all the indoor access points were were actually the the nine one one five axi right the, do you see this ax here ax ax stands for uh, 802.11 ax which is wi-fi 6 right and this i signifies that it's an indoor access point right so indoor access point uh, with in with sorry sorry i'm sorry this i stands for internal antennas right so uh, 9115 ax with internal antennas um uh, which had a bluetooth enabled now interesting question right why would you require bluetooth on an ap why would you require bluetooth on an ap right because your wi-fi is different in ap and bluetooth is different so nowadays these new ap's they come with a concept called uh, bluetooth low energy which apart from providing wi-fi services to to the end users they're also used for location tracking right they can use you can be used they can be used for wayfinding right so that's one of the features of a of a smart campus right um along with that they had 4x by 4x multi user mimo which means that an ap could talk to four clients at the same time and four clients can also talk back to the ap at at any given point of time along with beam forming so what is beam forming beam forming basically means that the ap will focus its uh, spatial stream it's going to send out that beam to that area where the actual number or the density of users is higher right it's a beautiful concept the name sounds like uh, you know something from star trek but it, that's what it does basically right it sends out a beam uh, to where the user is right and these devices support poe plus which is uh, um, you know a higher form of uh, power over ethernet then uh, the other ap that we implemented for them do you see this this here these uh, you know these points here these are uh, a place where you you know put in a tp uh, bnc uh, plug where you connect your external antennas right so uh, so this was you know for special situations where we required external antennas to also be connected um, to the um, uh, to the uh, to the access point so 8915 axe right and then uh, these are the access points that we connected outside in the stadium right i'm going to i'm just going to show you photographs of the stadium and uh, the outdoor areas so this was the ap that we used there the 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 1562i and there's a typo here this is the 1562e right it's a ruggedized access point right so it's uh, it's safe from the elements this is not a wifi 6 uh, radio it is a wifi 5 radio right it's a 802.11 ac wave 2 radio right so just wanted to highlight that two kinds of antennas were implemented one was uh, a dual band uh, dipole antenna um and the other one was an ip54 rated uh, dual band uh, 6 dbi directional antenna right and then uh, for certain places we ended up implementing an omni directional antenna uh, which provided 4 dbis of gain for 2.4 gigahertz and 7 dbis of gain for for 5 gigahertz so this is the building uh, this is one of the buildings that we implemented for this entire area is your uh, is your academic block where we implemented uh, uh, you know on the ground floor we implemented 24 access points and the first floor we implemented 18 access points right so if you look at it this is what the ekahau survey looked like right we we understood that there are multiple laboratories here right do you see these laboratories right so they will we wanted to make sure that these laboratories have got wifi access we determined that we don't require wifi coverage here at the staircase that was not provided and then notice how we honeycombed right notice how we honeycombed on the ground floor versus the first floor look at the ap placements here and compare them to the ap placements here we wanted to make sure that signals don't leak from the from the ground floor to the first floor so not only have we managed honeycombing on the horizontal level we've also managed honeycombing on the vertical level as well right this was the uh, the administration block the admin block and here again as you can see there was uh, you know there are different areas right this is you know uh, this is a meeting room there is a ceo cabin here this is a wide corridor and you know so green means green means good yellow means okay and red means bad right so we've tried to make sure that we're covering the customer from a green perspective in the conference room and in the meeting room and in the reception waiting area etc cetera, etc cetera, right so that's the admin block then uh, they had this beautiful sports complex do you see this it's uh, it was fascinating to see that you know this organization is not only focusing on uh, um on education but also co curricular activities right so they have this entire sports complex they did not want wifi here they wanted wifi here right 
this is where the people sit right so what we ended up doing is we took our uh, uh, 1562 uh, access points and we ended up placing them here to get wi-fi coverage to where the people are sitting right so and this here was another area which was your amphitheater and your and your multi and your uh, multifunctional area so we provided wi-fi coverage to them here as well by plotting outdoor access points on really really tall really really tall poles using 20 foot ladders right um this here is the recreation block in the recreation block they wanted coverage for the entire gymnasium right so this is the gymnasium the locker room uh, the, the the ladies gym the men's gym and uh, this here is the is the is the billiards area the table tennis area and the corridor right the carom and chess room etc so we had to provide wi-fi coverage here as well so again we used ekahau and we plotted this on the map and we were able to determine which APs are going to give us what kind of coverage. And what was critical for us here is that we got to know what kind of walls these are, right? These are dry walls, right? So we were able to know that these dry walls will be able to penetrate the signal and we will not have to implement an access point here, right? Because it's going to get coverage from here and it's going to get coverage from here, right? So that is why getting a good, accurate AutoCAD diagram matters right so you can do this plotting and, and predictive analysis correctly this year was the workshop right so we basically plotted around nine uh, access points all across this workshop uh, for uh, you know for vocational learning and covered multiple areas of the workshop and this year is the female hostel uh, right uh, here is uh, something that I'd like to show you right have a look here now in the female hostel in fact, let me show this to you in the boys' hostel. I'll be able to explain it better there, right? Have a look. Sorry. Yeah. So this is the male student hostel, right? Observe, observe this. Observe the the blue colored marker, right? Observe the blue colored marker. And uh, one second. And observe the red colored marker here, right? You notice what we're doing here. We've taken access points and we've plotted which frequency this access point is working on, right? The first, the, the red colored marker indicates the number six, which means at 2.4 gigahertz, I'm operating on channel number six, which means that any AP around me cannot be on channel number six. It has to be either on channel number one or channel number 11, right? So that's what you see. This is six. This is one. This is 11. This is one. This is six. This is one. This is 11. This is six, right? So that's how we have segregated it, right? We've made sure that all these access points have their uh, 2.4 gigahertz enabled. We've enabled their five gigahertz also. And there also we've ensured non-DFS channels all across 165, 157, 48, 64, 161, 56. This is how you prevent CCI. This is how you prevent co-channel interference, which is the number one detriment for a good Wi-Fi design. Anywhere, wherever there's signal bleeding, anywhere, wherever two different APs are talking on the same uh, channel, this problem of co-channel interference is going to come up. All right. Um, yeah, and this is again the guest house, right? We wanted they wanted uh, coverage in the lawn area. They wanted coverage in the lawn area. And then they wanted coverage in uh, on in different kind of rooms, right? And this is an exception, right? Remember when I said that you should not place access points in the hallways, right? This is an exception. The customer wanted an access point to be placed in a hallway, right? And uh, you know this is where we had to comply, right? So wherever possible, we tried to you know put the APs in dormitories, but wherever we had a requirement of uh, the environment asked for it or the customer asked for it. Or if the uh, yeah the environment of the customer asked for it, we had to place it in the hallways, right? Um, yeah. So this is the dormitory, right? So in the dormitory, we've got you know our guest rooms, we've got our bedrooms, right? Again, we've placed APs here in the hallways, as you can see, to provide better coverage. All right. So that's it at a high level. I mean, I guess uh, uh, you know when we started out, I want to summarize for a brief moment. When I started out, I said that we're going to talk about uh, you know, the journey of Wi-Fi and how Wi-Fi has uh, uh, has changed the way we learn, uh, live, work and play um, for the past so many years. 
and it's going to continue evolving in the future uh, as well. Um, we then talked about uh, the role of Wi-Fi in education, and then we talked about the role of Wi-Fi six and why it's crucial for uh, for uh, you know the next generation of applications such as 8K video streaming and artificial uh, and augmented reality and uh, and uh, and virtual reality. And then uh, finally, we talked about what are the best practices of a good Wi-Fi design. And finally, we touched upon the lessons that we have learned um, as a part of implementing Wi-Fi for a huge 47-acre uh, campus uh, for this uh, for a for an educational institute in this great nation. Um, I would appreciate your feedback. Um, I uh, what we plan to do is that we plan to do more such sessions in the future. Um, so I've shared my email address down below. I would really appreciate if you can share your feedback as to how the session went. What could have we done better? What did we do right? So that uh, going forward, we keep your feedback in mind um, uh, for future sessions and for future webinars. Um, I just want to check for one moment if there are any more questions and then I guess we can disengage. Great, I think this has been a very, very interactive uh, session. I can see a lot of questions floating around here. I appreciate everyone uh, for your time and, and I, I wish you a good evening and a good weekend ahead. Thank you for your time, everyone. Thank you, everyone.